thanks to all of you for being here with us today. Thank you to the Artex Lagos team, Toby Onobolu, especially for organizing today's talk. Uncle Victor, thank you for being here and uh, for your willingness to be in conversation with me today. Thank you. So to begin, I want to take us back to almost exactly 10 years. Yeah, how time flies. Yes, since <laughs> this book. I didn't even know until you pointed it out, you know. So. Was published. That's great. Um, so I would love it if you could begin by speaking with us, speaking to us about this publication and about how this publication really documents your interest in storytelling from perspectives on the continent in Nigeria, in Benin. Thank you. Um, this is kind of like a culmination of, of my writing, you know, so because I first moved back to Nigeria in 2008, uh, I had just finished my MFA in creative writing and the first job I'm getting was in Nigeria to be the creative director of uh, Next newspaper, which is also known as 234 Next. Um, which veers me off from writing. I had just finished two years of learning how to write, you know, um, not that I have not been writing before then. And the next thing I'm designing newspapers and designing magazines and all of that, you know, so editing, being photo editors and all of that, you know, so I needed to hold on to something. And also Nigeria was a bit fresh to me again, and I'm seeing it from a different perspective, from a fresher eyes after being away for a little while or a long while, uh, I needed to write. I needed to continue writing. So I asked the editor, which was uh, Ama Ogan, then that I would like to maintain a, a, a column, which was every Friday. So it went through a couple of editors as well. Morara edited some of it. Ama Ogan then became the full editor for for it and all of that. So I was, you know, it was about my daily experiences written there, but comparing while I was living in America and comparing here, about my childhood stories and everything. Plus I grew up, I mean, we, we, we have grandmothers that told us stories and everything. So storytelling was actually a very big part of my growing up. So again, this was um, part of how it came out then and it still continued to come out now, you know, so. Absolutely. And for those of you who are not familiar with this book, it's titled Excuse Me, and it's a fantastic compilation of short stories that span the personal, the prophetic, um, and very humorous um, recollections of his experiences, Victor's experiences in Nigeria specifically. And what I love about it is, are the drawings that intersplice the stories. Drawings on uh, meeting minutes, meeting agendas, and those drawings have grown in scale and medium into what you presented here at Artex Lagos this year. So I would love it if you could speak a bit about the transition for you from these doodles and scrawlings into a very ambitious and rigorous visual art practice. I've always drawn. I mean, I can remember as far back as I was four. Luckily enough for me, my dad kept a lot of my drawings. So I have the ones that I can date back to when I started using pen and papers uh, up to, you know, when I was like nine, I have a painting of when I was nine because they were they were really kept and, and, and I've never not drawn, you know. So some of the doodles you see there, <laughs> called doodles, was, they were during meetings, but because I was also very conscious of archiving, I wanted people to, this as a form of knowing what was going on there, the, the players, the keep people that started very early with, with what is known as next, because for some people now, that is history. There are people that know it, there are people that don't know it, but maybe someday somebody will pick up this book and kind of like ask that question, what is, what is this? And see the names there and all of that, you know, so, but I have always drawn uh, on every, you know, every blank surface kind of calls me to do something with it, you know? And as you grow older a bit, you find more voices to do what you want to do. You find more materials to do what you want to do. And also growing up in the village was, is, is helpful as an artist because, I mean, if you don't have a, a toy store, you don't have a Walmart to go to, you don't have a spa or something to go and buy your toys back then, you have to make them yourself. So we are kind of builders. We'll build things, we'll make things, we'll make masks and stuff like that. So 
um, that didn't leave me, you understand, you know. So when I see materials, I work with them, I begin to question them. Over time, they begin to reveal themselves to me. First, they come one way, but by the time you start exploring them, they begin to have different meanings and expansion and expansion and expansion. And if you stay long enough with a certain materials, it reveals itself to you what you need to do with it. And um, here we are, you know, so, but it would have been nice to show you once I showed seven years ago because I was, I was one of the pioneers of uh, Artex, you know, so. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, speaking about your time growing up in the village, you know, a cornerstone of your practice are these drawings, these line drawings that um, you always credit to your time in, in the village. Could you speak a bit about how you've taken those forms and made them your own in your practice? Yeah. Um, you know, like I always said, every part of my village growing up was art, whether performance, 2D, 3Ds, and all of that. And I also happened to grow up in a very traditional home. My grandfather was, um, you know, chief of the village because it's, it's, it's according to age. So he happened to have lasted long enough to be the chief of the village and the coronation was quite elaborate. I was nine then. And um, so his staff of office was, was carved and I was very fascinated by the person that was commissioned to carve it. Um, he, he, he was... Uh, <laughs> The man was kind of, you know, to say it mildly, he was blinded in one eye. The, the sculptor was blinded in one eye. So when he brought the staff of office, he had the head and everything Then he kind of marked around one of the eyes. You know, it was, it was a way, you know, as I was growing up and looking at the photographs that my uncle took of those staff of office and during the coronation, I realized that he left a mark there at some point, you know, whether consciously or subconsciously. Uh, there. So in that way, you know, going to different places of commemoration, different places of worship that are beside churches, um, there are just art everywhere when I was growing up. And those were what I was repeating. If you have some, some of the walls, the walls were not just ordinary. When they are wet, they, they will carve on them and stuff like that. So I will repeat them and just like consciously and subconsciously repeat them. And my books, I wasn't very good in arithmetic. So my notebook of arithmetic, I added those ones to my drawing books, you know, so and just write on them. So eventually it keeps growing and growing and growing and you start adding to it then you make it your visual language and um, that's where we are. Thank you. So this installation is titled Uli Nyofo. Did I say it well? <laughs> okay, you say it. He <laughs> said, no, that sounded like more like Igbo. It's Uli <laughs> It's only noifu. Yeah, only noifu. The lineage that never ends. A continuous lineage. And I think that is, is so prescient with respect to your practice, but also with respect to how you position yourself within this conversation of repatriation. And beyond that, the appreciation of contemporary art that is speaking about Benin culture and heritage. So I'd love to turn to the installation, um, the lineage that never ends and speak about color first and foremost, the significance of the colors that you use here, which are much more reduced from some of the colors in your other works in your earlier works, especially. Uh, I mean, we can start from the colors. Um, they are borrowed from the, Benin is known for red, you know, so. <laughs> Mr. Herbert came to see this exhibition. I was like, you Benin people, why are you always like putting red in everything? You know, so I mean, the soil is red, natural, it's very red and all of that. Then when you add to the fact that we have taken coral beads as, as our traditional language uh, totem kind of, you know, so to create a lot of things. The Obas, uh, the, the king, the Oba of Benin, uh, most of his regal, uh, stuff are made with coral beads and can actually wear black to the to the palace. Really, you can't wear black to the palace. Uh, during the festival, you have to wear something that is bright, something you can wear red, white, any other bright color, black, you understand? You will be turned back from the from the gate of the palace, you know? So I have <clears throat> I have always uh, used these colors. Uh, my friend Tan will said, if there's no red in your painting, you have not painted that work, you know? So, uh, it's coming from, from that visual uh, aesthetics first, you know, then you have the corals, you have the red, then you have the white, you know, so, but also growing up, the earth tone colors that we are used to paint most of the walls, 
in the village were all like red, bright red clay and all of that. So I mean, consciously you, you, you kind of, subconsciously you, you accumulate those kind of colors and they begin to make sense. But then white also in the palace or in a place of worship also represent chalk, you know? Um, so chalk is for peace. And there are some, you know, some places of commemoration that you go to is just red and white only. Then the earthen pots that are there are all white. The chalks that have accumulated over the years are white, you know? So it comes into, play there but then we are we are blacks you understand you know so the face of the of some of the pieces i use black to to depict them because that is what we are as a strong color uh in that sense you know so black part of it come as a form of aesthetics but it's also a uh, harder metaphorical meaning being a black person you know thank you secondly i wanted to ask you about the key components of the installation the sound bit, uh, which is titled Bird of Prophecy, the rosary beads, and then Pregnant World. Could you begin by talking to us about the rosary bead series and how you began that series? I think it's a really fantastic story. Well, I, I was, again, I was, you know, I grew up a Catholic, you know, I went to Catholics primary school, secondary school, got baptized at the age of nine, and it was really cool to be baptized as a, as a kid in the village because when the other kids are receiving, we call it receiving, which means you have to receive Holy Communion and you are sitting in the audience and you are not walking to the, to the white priest to put a, a, <laughs> one of those things in your mouth. You felt like you were left out, you know? So, but also we would buy a piece of rosary and wait for a priest to come. Then we give the rosary to the priest to pray on for us, you know? So, Gradually, we we also look down on people that have like carries around their neck because that was the thing that was the signifier. Like, okay, this one is not a Christian. This one is coming from a, a traditional way of life and all of that. And subconsciously, we were eroding something and replacing it with something. You know, um, so as I grew older and all of that, I began to look at that whole totemization. Um, you know, how do you canonize one thing? and demonize another thing, you understand? Which, has, which is one of the biggest things that has happened to uh, our traditional art, our classic art, because we see it, we start shouting blood of Jesus. Meanwhile, the white man will come, take it and go and sell it for millions of dollars, you understand? You know? So in 2017, I was preparing for the uh, Venice Biennale as one of the artists that was featured. Uh, I used, I wanted to, commemorate the people that the artists that came before me, you know, kind of take it back to Benin, all the artists that have come, which was, which I titled a biography of the forgotten, you know, because a lot of the museum, they are changing them now, but when you go to most of the Western museum, they will just say artist unknown, you understand, just, you know, attribute it to the whole thing. I was like, people that made this work, they can tell you the families that made this work, especially in Benin, they look at a piece of work and tell you the gifts, the family that made it because they have signifiers, they have markings, they have signatures that are not what you can tell, but they can tell it, you know? So, but when you remove this work in situ, then the, the meanings and all of those things change. So the lady that we are supposed to rent the, uh, the Nigerian pavilion where we will host it, came back and so she saw my, my works and came back and said that the work were fetish. So uh, that, that this, the, the place is a Christian place. They can't show this kind of works there. So the first, my first reaction was, I wrote a letter, you know, I say like defending myself, like, dude, I'm baptized and all of that, you know? So uh, I can't, I'm even more Catholic than the Pope, you know? So, but she will have none of that and she insisted, but then I insisted that I'm not gonna change my work. I, I've worked on it for almost a year. You don't just wake up and start changing your body of work for a biennale, you know. So we had to change our location where we where we installed the work and other people's other artist work that were with there. So when I came back, uh, was out of that anger and to return the gaze back to them. I decided to use rosaries to make the features and and kings and things that are related to Benin, so that when I make it with the totems that you have sold to us as pure then I would like to hear the conversation that will come out from there. Every single thing there is made from rosaries. Take a look at 
what a Bini Oba will wear, what a Bini person will wear, or what an African will wear, and all of that. Every single thing was with rosary and tread, you know. So that was why I started making works with rosary. And but of course, he has expanded to other. Uh, it kept kept expanding and expanding now as a medium for me. But that was the beginning of my using of rosaries, pretty much. Can you share the experience that you had in Benin? Sorry, in Berlin, rather, when um, several high chiefs from Benin came and attended your artist talk um, just earlier this year? Yeah, um, that was. I think that was that was last month or two months ago. So there's a show that is going on in the museum right now because um, one of my works uh, from the Rosary series, from the Rosary series was part of the installation with other classic Bini um, bronzes. Um, so there was an artist talk, of course, they, they invited a lot of the chiefs from the palace. So there were about five of them that were there and they came and they listened to the talk, you know, so I told them, you know, I, I told the audience how it started and talked about my tradition and my relationship with Bini and all of that, you know, so right after the talk, they, <laughs> they invited me and, you know, prayed for me. I really like, then the work suddenly took on a different meaning for them. Not suddenly, but it took on a different meaning for them. What I was seeing an artwork, they were seeing a whole representation of something completely different. And what was interesting is like, you need to tell the curator that people cannot walk around it because they're not supposed to walk around off the back of an oba, you know? So they should move the walk back against the wall. That is the only thing, you know, you have to let them know. I was like, okay, that's going to be an interesting, uh, you know, conversation. It's, it's interesting how, the works that we made, because we have always said that it's beyond just art. You know, we use art to represent something, but for us, art has always not been art for art's sake. It has always been something more deeper than that in, in that in that sense, you know. So that was a kind of like uh, a testament to my belief in the art that, that we create that is beyond just uh, something that is visually appealing uh, and that. Did that experience inform how you installed the works here at Artex Lagos? Not really. I mean, you can still walk around it. I mean, everybody, I mean, if you, if you make works, critics are welcome to kind of give their opinions and all of that. But again, I mean, I always say it, you know, there was no other way of installing it, but I like them to be installed because it, so that the shadow that is supposed to create can create to give it a, a more further meaning than it is, you know, so, but but here it was to create an experience so people can kind of walk into uh, into something, into an embodiment, you know, and have um, a feel of, you know, a feel of something a little bit different in, in that sense, you know. So and I'm grateful to all the people that worked on the on the project with me, the the architect, Papa, Bio, uh, Toby, and you, of course, everybody, you know, they all made it come together and the best ideas won, you know, so, yeah. Wonderful. Could you speak a bit about Bird of Prophecy? Um, it's your first work of sound art that I've experienced. And uh, I would love for you to speak about the references that you're making in that work to Benin culture and the bird of prophecy as it has existed in Benin up until this point? The bird of prophecy is called Ahiamoro. You know, a loose translation of Ahiamoro is actually not bird of prophecy, but it's bird of harvest, right? When you're going to the farm, you know, I happen to have actually, it still exists. Um, it's kind of like a call and response bird, you know, so, but, in our cosmology is considered prophecy, you understand? And history has it that Obai Sige, I mean, the bird was usually would, if, if an Oba and his armies are going to war, they will consult, you know, when they hear the sound of that bird, that means it's a no go, don't go to that war, you know, as you go back and all of that. But Obai Sige, who was quite uh, one of the strongest Oba and all of that, I wanted to expand the, the kingdom was going to war and the, the, the history has it that the bird was now, you know, uh, screaming and he just caught the bird and said a bird should no longer tell us what to do, you know, and kind of caught the bird and asked uh, bronze casters to create 
uh, use it to create a totem ideal for uh, ideal ideal phone, you know. So so that's part of it. When you go to most of the museums, every museum that has been in bronze has a piece of ideal phone in that place. And the way to know the one that has been used for centuries, you have to look at the side because you see that it has a dent because it's used to announce, uh, to make pronunciation, um, they hit it to announce uh, an albaz, uh, you know, then during festival, during rituals was used. So when all those ones were taken out and shipped to, were looted, they still kept making them and all of that, you know. So I decided to make one, a, a life-size one, you know, so, um, you know, uh, the prophecy, the title of the piece is actually a prophecy deferred. You know, so, you know, 16th century was the first time Obaisi game made that whole thing. Fast forward to 19th century, a major war came to us that we couldn't have control over and the whole uh, the kingdom was decimated, you understand, you know. So again, I'm relating it and going back and forth between multiple centuries with the peace. So what are we listening to within the peace? Yeah. <laughs> The, the piece is, this is why it's always very encouraging for, for people to work together and have a teamwork because everybody's going to bring their different, um, you know, um, their different voices, their, you know, to say it lightly. When I was in Berlin during this exhibition, so they invited Professor Josephine Abbe, who is a professor of uh, theater in, in the University of Benin. And she was there. And this woman at every given moment would break into songs. We were on the boat in the afternoon touring Berlin, and this woman was a full life performing artist, like she couldn't sit down and all of that, you know. So I was very fascinated by, by her performance. Uh, you, at the drop of a hat, you know, Josephine is singing, you know. So, and I was very captivated by, by her, and I was already planning uh, this installation and all of that. So then she also has a song that that she produced for the museum. So I, I met her, I was like, please, I would like a, uh, one of the digits for Vorame because Benny creates songs along the arts. You know, you create art, when you, are, when you are creating the art, you have songs to go with them and all of that. But when Oba Vorame was uh, dethroned and exiled to Calabar by the British army, a lot of songs, a lot of dirge, Benny were just using songs to keep the throne alive. That is why for 14 years, uh, there was no way the British could replace anybody with the lineage that never ends, you know. So that throne was empty, you know, uh, physically, not spiritually, for 14 years, you know. So the songs that were created to bid him goodbye as he was being taken away to exile and all of that, and when they heard that he has passed on in exile, there are a lot of songs that 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 many people still used to weep for him and dead. So the dead is actually like a narrative of what the British did, a song for Bavurame. And if you listen very carefully, she was actually crying in that song uh, towards the end of it, you know? So when we had that conversation, she was like, okay, when I go to Benin, I'm gonna like, so they were able to like do it for me, uh, which is why I fused it to so that people can know that, again, the whole art of Benin doesn't just revolve around bronzes only. There are a multiplicity of other, creativity that comes out from that region and also even Nigeria in its entirety, you know. Can you speak a bit more about that, um, especially as a number of institutions are looking to return some or all of their Benin bronzes and they are left with a void in their collections. Um, tell me what you think these institutions can and should do in this moment of transition. <laughs> We are left with void for 125 years. <laughs> you know, so yeah, we were left with the void for 125 years, and that is gonna be their headache. But um, <laughs> but we didn't stop creating because there is this Western fixation with oh, if the if the works that we are taking were not violently extracted from us, it doesn't have any meaning, right? So how do you go to museums? You have an entire wing of looted art, of arts that were taken by, there was no negotiation because even the ones that are not like fought for or looted, they were just taken. We know that for a fact, you know, so because colonialism was a massive rape uh, activity of, of our culture and what we had, you know. So how do you go to an entire wing and 
is stopped at a particular century, right? Then all of a sudden, did Africa stop creating? So why are you not pumped up to say, okay, our acquisition committee, let's look at a bridge because that decimation of that bridge to like look at you as a contemporary artist, as an orphan is there because if you cannot link, if you link a, a Spanish artist to um, say Picasso, he elevates, you lift, list to uh, Caravaggio, he elevates, you list, you know, like, you know, to Turner in England, he elevates. But for us, we have to climb ourselves again out of a ditch that we are thrown into over and over and over again, you know. So if they have a void, they, I mean, like they can, they, if they start collecting African art, starting from modernism, it can last them another 125 years before they even fill their, their, their museums that are filled with what is going to be taken out of there. You know, so that has also been part of my talk about restitution that look, you can't be visited because you guys took this thing violently. There's a certain joy, there's a certain neocolonialism uh, hype that you get from the fact that, oh, you are, you are talking, but you are looking at, you know, you know, things that were wrongly taken and you are still hyping about it. What happened to the rest of the artists that have been creating? What are the ones who's in your, in, your, in your collections, you know? So again, that is, if they have void, they have things to fill it, so yeah. And I think that, you know, in this installation, your use of sound and your use of bronze in the installation reaffirms what you've said, you know, that we're still creating and we can create in the mediums that are available to us contemporarily. Would you like to share a bit with us about Pregnant World and the evolution of that work? Um, when I decided to like take bronze, the more I visited Western museums, and even when they open their vaults, because you always see bronze heads all over the place and everything. And these guys pretty much swept the house up to hairpins, up to keys, up to water jugs, um, medicine cabinets, everything. So I realized that why you are not seeing a lot of wooden works that were also taken because they were burnt. Bronze will not burn, it has already gone through fire, you know. So, but a lot of everything, water jugs and everything, because they are bringing them out now, we have access to the vaults and all of that. There are a lot of works that are not seen publicly, but they are the most intricate and the most personal objects that you can ever have, you know. So, because bronze is like, like paper drawing for the Benins, you understand? Make, make anything from bronze, you know. So, I realized that there's, again, coming back to there's too much physician with that beneath bronze head, beneath bronze head, forgetting that we can do anything and everything with bronze. You know, so growing up, you know, so we still have some of them. I decided to challenge myself a little bit more and see what can I, you know, what else can I make out of bronze apart from like maybe um, figurative, figuration and everything. So I decided to create an egg, you understand, which was the first work that I did and I showed at uh, Lima Mopping in New York last year. Um, so it was like a pregnant world, you know, great expectation and all of that. It took us a lot of time to like create it because we still use the lost wax process in Benin. So, but this year when it came, I was like, okay, I'm going to scale it up a little bit and hatch the egg and let new possibilities come out, you know. So that is why you see this one that you've seen. It's a full egg it was already created full before I then decide to like uh leave it broken you understand you know so to hatch because i mean egg has to be hatched right so yeah and that's why this one is thank you for that thank you very much um i really love that body of work of yours and i'm very excited to see it develop and i hope that we'll be able to see further developments of it here in lagos um so i would love to hear from you what you're currently working on uh, what's next for you now that this installation is behind you? Um, I know you're always on a plane zooming off to some place to do so, but it would be wonderful to just hear anything you can share about what's to come. Oh, uh, this, this took a lot from me. I mean, there, I mean, even though some of the works are much older than when I got the brief that I was going to do a special project for it. I mean, I, I'm, I'm constantly working. Um, you know, I'm constantly working towards one project or the other. There is no particular one that I'm saying that I'm looking, the only one I'm looking for, I mean, it's a fair, is at Basel, Hong Kong uh, next year, you know, so um, I'm looking forward to that. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
So I think we can take a few questions um, from the audience. When we talk about restitution in Nigeria, for those outside the art world, many people find the issue unimportant. Can you share with us why restitution matters and is more than just a conversation about stolen objects? So I know you've spoken about this a bit already. Um, one thing that I've learned from you about the Benin bronzes, which I did not know, was that oftentimes the most valuable objects were the ones that were taken most violently. And I think oftentimes we don't think about the degree of violence with which knowledge and objects have been taken from the continent. So I would love to hear anything else you'd like to share on that topic. And maybe some of your personal experiences about what you've seen in your researching uh, the Benin bronzes in the world. Well, I mean, it can be a little bit unfortunate that we we only look at the physical object, you're right, you know, because before you can take a people's culture, you literally have to kill them, right? Because we are not even looking at the human uh, carnage that came with it, women and children that were more than by magazine guns, you know, so it's not, it's for me personally, maybe for other, um, for other people, it's something a bit different, but we also have to realize that even the conversation about restitution, 95% of that conversation is by Western people that have taken it. So it has also become an industry for them, okay? So your own conversation, your own history is still being discussed by others why we keep asking why restitution. But I mean, we can revolve it, we can use the objects as the symbols, but we are looking at how do you recover your culture back? You know, because again, I was in Berlin, I was there with a bronze, a much younger bronze caster who is coming from seven generations of bronze casting, right? Phil or Modame. And I was moved to tears really because when they opened the, the their, their, their storage, this guy was, I mean, he was wearing gloves, was literally like craving it, like looking for, for the knowledge, like how do you make the back? Because you have to realize that a whole lot of the pictures of the older ones, you only see the 2D of it. But for a bronze caster, their own MFA is, is actually being around one, look at it, look at it, study it a lot and find out how did they make this and begin to kind of replicate it. But these things have been taken away over the years and all of those things. And within them, within that, a creative structure, something has been yanked off for the longest time. And he was literally like looking at everything as if it's like you, you take a kids to a candy store. And it was a bit painful because, I mean, this is the first time he's having access to this detailed work. Because, I mean, like they are really extremely detailed. I joke with it. I'm like, there is no Instagram. There, there was no Instagram or Twitter or uh, um, um, Facebook to distract the people that were making these works. And so they paid, they paid serious attention to, to details, you know. So restitution is very important from a cultural perspective, from a learning perspective. And let's not forget that a lot of the works, if you are looking at Bini bronzes as an outsider from Bini, it's a piece of work for you. It's a piece of art for you. But for the Benins, is how history was documented. It was our archive is like, I went with historians because they bring different people, historians, performance, casters and everything. And every Bini historians have, people have written about this and they know it's a knowledge that I was taking a young from them. And we needed to start filling those knowledge back again. It's going to take us a lot of, a long time, but we have to continue doing it, you know? So recently I, I saw a, a, a magazine that was written by uh, uh, Edun Akezoa about Benin bronzes 1897. And he, he documented it. And it's weird that I'm seeing that magazine for the first time, four days to the opening. And there was no other picture of, of, of a kid. So he used a lot of other images of the bronzes to, to talk about the narrative. Then he used a picture of a child who is like maybe four. So the caption underneath it was there and I was looking at it, I was like, who is this then? He said that the great, great grandson of a Bavarame is along the line of succession. And lo and behold, 
that is the current king that is reigning right now. That article was written in 1960, and I don't think even the king has that picture. I don't know, hopefully they have it in the archive. And to see that, it really brought it home for me for the title that I picked for this exhibition. Thank you so much. I would also like to hear a bit more from you about how you feel the repatriated Benin's bronzes can be reintegrated into the Edo community. I know you're involved in a museum that is in the works, if you'd like to speak a bit about that. But I'm very curious about how um, these repatriation efforts will have a ripple effect across the communities who own these objects or should own these objects. Me, if you have already been returned or integrated into the into the space, but sometimes the question is, there has to be a lot of reintegration one because they have been the way and um, for the longest time, we have to kind of like find a way to re-engage with them. You understand, do I have the knowledge? I don't think so, but everybody have a role to play. You understand, you bring it, then the next person who is a curator, take a look at it. Curator, not in, in, the, in the Western way, you understand? Because we had our own curator, the priests, but the curators that we have in our society because they are the ones that decide what goes where and what goes where and all of that so that the writing is in the right place you know so i think we need to engage everybody it's not from not from a western museological system you understand from our own traditional ways and all of that and it's a body of knowledge we might think oh they are going to keep it away in the palace nobody is going to say it that is very mistaken because you have not been to the environment and the places where these things are made. There are those that are not supposed to be seen. Everybody, when they were, when the queen died and they coronated uh, King Charles, they showed you what they wanted to show you. When the lights and the cameras are off, you don't know what is going on. You know, so the crown they brought to the front for you to see might be different from the one that actually makes him a king inside when the doors are closed. So I don't know why everybody really wants a situation whereby, okay, you know, the whole culture has to be naked. No, if American culture is not naked. So we put the ones that are for knowledge, open knowledge, then the ones that has always played a certain role in the community, we have people that have that knowledge base to reintegrate them back in the community. Uh, so the museum also is not built only for bronzes. I mean, look at Nigerian art. You understand? We need more institutions that where we can show our work so that we don't have to start yearning for outside the country and all of that. We can do it here. We need more museums. We need more institutions. Um, and when we build them, it's not just going to be for the bronzes and all of that, you know, it's not going to be an ethnological museum, it's going to be a living museum so that, you know, our works, you and I can see, you know, for future generation, they can go to their own place and see it, not have to pay for visas and pay for uh, tickets to go and see the works of their, of their, of their ancestors, you know, so, yeah. Absolutely, and that's why I'm so happy that you've shown such a robust and intense installation here at Artex Lagos, you know, so thank you for that. Thank you very much. All right. So we have another question from the audience. How well do you think the bronze works can be preserved if returned to Nigeria in a museum or the Obas Palace? Preservation as a physical object or preservation as display for seeing? Um, I, mean, I mean, I can speak on both of them. Both preservation. Of both. <laughs> I mean, when you talk about preservation, that was one of the excuses that the British and the Western people that wanted to hold on to these things we are saying, you know, of course, I mean, so they were not made 18th century, right? So where were they? Some of these works date back to maybe 13th century, 14th century, and you took them in 19th centuries, about four centuries later, you are questioning us how we are going to take care of them. You made something in good condition for you to steal and sell and populate your museums and make money, billions of dollars and pounds from it, when we are asking for them to be returned, you are now asking how we're going to take care of it. Where did you meet them? How did you take them in the first place? Right. So again, these are questions that you know I used to answer them when 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 they asked me outside the country and all of those things. But we also need to enlighten ourselves that with when it comes to preservation, yes, things are falling apart in our in our institutions. But again, uh, I happen, these magazines are the best thing that have happened to me. They are called Nigeria. It's actually Nigeria, the magazines. They were published. So I have the oldest one dating back to the 50s. And some of them, you actually see that we had laboratories where some of these works were tested and looked at, and there are pictures of them, right, in our museums and all of that, you know. So 
again, we are trying to recreate those things, which is, you know, I'm not plugging the Doe Museum of West African Art, but it's, it's a big part of what that museum is going to be doing, testing it for those works that we have locally and those works that we are going to bring back. You understand, you know, so yes. Again, I've already answered that question that the works that need to go to the palace, we have to go to the palace because they were functional art. They were in art for art's sake. So if we are bringing it back, the ones that need to go to palace, we go to palace. The one that we need to open up for the uh, preservation of knowledge, open source system and all of that, we open it up. I mean, CBD was a, was was what was was a private language. You understand what I'm saying? But the pieces and some of them filtered out. Uli is an open source for everybody to benefit from, and all of that. You understand? Agme Inisha is an open source, which is one is influences my work and my writing and my lines. Those are open source. You have closed source, then you have open sources, and both of them have a place in our society. I think that um, it's. It's a really interesting topic to consider as we try to figure out again how to reintegrate these objects into communities that haven't had them for over a hundred years. Um, because one thing that I've learned from working in, in Benin in collaboration with the foundries there is that it's not everyone that is allowed to cast in bronze. You know, it in and of itself is um, a reliquary of spirituality and heritage. It's not everyone that can touch that, that material. Um, but I think it's a testament to the complexity of culture and heritage that they are able to collaborate with artists like myself who are Yoruba and, and Igbo and Jamaican um, to create contemporary works of art that confront heritage. Um, and so I think that I'm very excited about the MOA efforts. I think, it, and well done to you and, and the team collaborating with you on that. Um, right. Next question. Can you tell us about the process of making this new work for art techs, especially as you worked with sound for the first time? Um, I mean, I work with a good team. I have an amazing, amazing um, young ladies that come from the mainland. I've worked with them since uh, 2017 when I was first preparing, because they were the one that actually first saw the uh, bronze pieces to to a large body of canvas and the mirrors and all of that, you know. So um, I've worked with them since 2017, and when I then transited to using this material, they were just natural fit, and we have both grown together. You see the early ones and all of that to these massive ones and all of that, you know. So uh, Temitayo is actually her name. <laughs> You know, so that is the main that is the main girl and all of that. I've worked with a very great team. You understand uh, for over some of my staff that I work with have lasted with me. You know, so somebody like Rashid Olawakbo has worked with me for eleven years. You know, so we 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 say team. It's a team. It's a team effort. What you are seeing here is not just Victor. They understand where I'm going. They might not see the entire thing, but they 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 they've been on this journey with me uh, for that long. You know, so. Uh, when it come to, when it came to the sound, it was uh, first Josephine recorded it and sent it to me. Luckily enough, um, you know, technology has been very helpful. Send it to me, and um, you know, then uh, Bio, who is the curator for the show, Bio Hansan Bello, said that we have to like, um, you know re-edit it so that it has this multiple surround. Again, it's my first time of using sound and I was really interested in using I mean, like most of the most of the things that I've worked with, I've never used them before. When I used Neon, when I used Neon in 2020 to create very elaborate work in, in Las Vegas, I've never used Neon before. So, but when I saw the process, then I realized that I can give them a language to interpret for me, you know, so, and they did very well with it. So Josephine sent it and uh, Bio and the art text team looked for somebody that could edit it for us. And again, it's the beginning of a new inclusion to my expanding uh, uh, body of work. Your work features symbols of family lineage, tradition, and religion, local content. Do you think the global Western gentrification of the past few decades makes Benin stroke knock art more valuable than modern art like NFTs? Okay, I think they mean contemporary art. Um, and why, especially to the local Nigerian? 
Um, that's a long question. Yeah, so <laughs> basically, I think the person is asking yeah. whether the gentrification, gentrification. Yeah, I don't okay. think. OK. Yeah. So I think they're asking about whether antiquities are more valuable than contemporary art because of the ways in which the West has not gentrified them, but valued them. Not really. I mean, you know, this work that you are seeing today that is contemporary to you in another 50, 100 years will become antiquity because we are now already moving into a new phase of work and all of that. Uh, time, time is what, you know, attributes certain quality and value to particular works and stuff like that. There are works that maybe you say them as some work made uh, as a young artist that his contemporaries or the critics or the curators or the collectors of the day didn't pay too much mind to, but today everybody is panting to kind of collect them and all of that. I think time has a way of beautifying artwork and, you know, and all of that. But I don't, I have spoken about how the, the, the West, because they are the one, they can trace the provenance, right, to when they yanked it off from Congo or they yanked it off from Benin. It went through, when you're looking at provenances, you see the, the more valuable the works are, then you start looking at the name of hands that they have passed through, then you start seeing that they are all white families that have owned them and colonizers that have owned them, right? So then how do we also then not be looking at people that are gentrifying the works, but we are looking at our collectors that also have similar works? Mr. Lufemi Akisoya, who is going to be having the conversation this afternoon, has an elaborate body of work. Again, people can go there, those that possibly even have the means of collecting that body of the work, they go there with holy water and start sprinkling the whole place. You know, so we, we need to re-engage. And one of the things that I want the Rosary to do is actually like, how do you kind of not demonize African art? How do you kind of, I don't use the word decolonize because I don't even know what that means, but how do you reorient people to embrace the things that are coming out from their community? You understand? These works are made in my studio here in Lagos, which is, if this was a walking city, it won't take you more than 30 minutes to get there. But there are people that we see, they will still shrink back and all of those things and all of that. I bought the rosaries from, uh, from Balogo Market, you understand? You know, So pieces of canvas were bought from Yaba, you understand? This thread were bought from Balogo Market. So they are all local materials and all of those things. You know, So we, we have to re-engage our people. A lot of our people need to be re-engaged with their heritage, their work, so that they don't shrink from it and start bringing what they have been whitewashed to believe that is more purified than this. I mean, how come you don't have sense? How come you don't have sense? Why, why is it that Black people never did any good thing to be able to like uh, be given that sainthood and all of that? You pray to St. Peter. I don't know St. Peter. I know St. Okosum. I know St. Uh, Moregi. You understand? You know? So there is a lot of engineering that needs to be done for us to be able to embrace this. And this is why they, the, our government will never pay attention to arts and culture. You are merging cultural department and cultural uh, um, uh, ministry to information. And yet the only thing you actually have, the only, the only currency that you have that you can sell and use anywhere in the world is arts and culture coming out from Nigeria, from music to find out to anything. Yet you don't have a, a ministry that is dedicated to it and people that know what they are doing with it. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. There's something you mentioned um, about sourcing materials, and it reminded me of an earlier conversation we had had about the rosary beads and the commodifi commodification and commercialization of religion um, and Western religion specifically. I wondered if you could share a bit about that with us. Well, I mean, religion has always been side by side with when you look at history, not just us has been has never been a strange bedfellow to um to commerce you understand you know so because when you actually look at it again i keep going back to colonialism you have missionaries people on the one side but then you have the business people on the other side and all of that why one was doing the damage the other one was doing the metal damage as well you know so um so it has always been a a, a selling point and people will always want to buy hope Okay, so there's a lot of hope selling, you know. So um, at some point, you know, we have to start addressing these things uh, as such. I'm a Christian, you understand what I'm saying? You know, I don't shy away from it, but I also grew up in a traditional home, you know. So 
why not have that duality? Why do you want to be one side of the coin? If, it's, if you have a coin, the value of it does not reside on one side. If, 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 if the other side is washed out and cleaned out, it's useless, it's, it's, it's fake, you know? So we have to look at that duality and, and, and not be able to just like shift to one side and all of that and begin to demonize one and canonize the other one, you know? So the emblems, the totems that we have, we need to figure out a way to, to bring them back into our community, into our lives and all of those things, you know, so. No, thank you for that. I mean, I think the other aspect that came out when I was thinking about these is the complexity of globalization and the reality that a lot of what we can use in contemporary art, what you use in your practice is brought in from elsewhere, um, China specifically. Exactly. These are not, by the way, the rosaries are not from the Vatican. They are from China. You know, so yeah, every single one of them is from China, you know, so yeah. And I think Again, going back to the rosaries, um, I wanted to ask you about the glow in the dark feature on the white work, because we did talk about uh, your use of color, but also your site specificity with respect to how you're thinking about these works being shown in Lagos, because this is the, this is the first time that you're exhibiting yeah. the rosary works here. Um, there, is, there, is, there are multiple layers to, I mean, it's an art fair. There's so much that you can do to be able to even execute it in this form. But in a, in a more institutional sense, the work are created so that they can, they can work whether there's light or no light, you know? So it's created for that, um, you know, because when the light goes out, the, the white part of it glows and reveal a different body of work. The big one actually has features, people, different things going on. When the when the light goes out and the light it consumes again, this whole body of work is is coming from a place of memory, a place of of, of childhood. A lot of the works that I create are actually coming all the way from back back history and everything. As kids, again, we had we had the ones that glow in the night. We had rosaries that glow in the night. Uh, in the village, when there is no electricity and everything, we put it close to the light. Uh, the lamp, and then we put it around our neck and run into the night. Then we see it glowing and somebody running into the night. You know, so when you are creating work, those things keep coming. And I, I didn't study early ones. The first two that are in institutional collection right now uh, did not have that glow because those were the very first two I created. Didn't have that glow. But eventually, when you are working with work and all of those things, you stay with them long enough, things begin to reveal themselves to you. So I decided to include those ones to it. Um, so in, in, in any given situation where you can control the light, uh, I would say that can be tried like whereby you, you have light sensitive or motion sensitive, light comes on, then after like five minutes and light goes out, then you have a different kind of exhibition to that, you know, so, and it's not jazz. <laughs> <laughs> um, another question that I just remembered, I wanted to ask you, can you talk about the transition you've been making between abstraction and figuration, specifically with respect to the two largest works in your installation where the figures are less prominent than those in the other works that are in the installation, but also those from earlier moments in your practice. Yeah, I, I, I'm i sorry for the, I, I should have sent you some of the images that I've documented from, from the village so that you can see that you go to a particular wall, you have signs and symbols and all of those things. They go to another wall, there are figures and figurations and all of that. So they are, they, they, are, they are both things that I can easily work with going back and forth between them and all of those things, you know. So in, in, in that sense, um, we have those things in our, in, in, our, in our culture, in every part of the African culture, we can decide to like exaggerate. If you have seen work by Lamy de Fakaye and really like, you know, she can, he can exaggerate with wood, right? You look at 277's work, he can exaggerate with things between that, that outwardness and that, uh, you know, that in and out of that outwardly and all of that. So there are, some of our stories are very like, they take you, they are the Harry Potters. I mean, of course, when grandmother, there are some, I had six grandmothers, each of them have their different styles of storytelling. One will tell you very pleasing story about the Oba and his wives and all of that. And the other one was a horror, <laughs> was for the master of horror, you know? So when you even look at that from things that are abstract, stories that are abstract and all of those things, when you look at it from that perspective, the African proverb is, is, is abstract. 
right? We use it a lot. It then begins to explode in your head as a wise person, you know? So again, that is why I go back and forth between figuration and abstraction in my works. But what ties all of them together is actually like the iconography that I use in tying them together. And so all of this one, again, this red work, again, when the light goes out, then you see figures in it. There are figurations behind behind it that you see that we are merged once the light goes out of that. Thank you. All right, we have one more question from the audience so far. With your practice, do you think you may reach a point you, where you will have said all that needs to be said and this, and thus your work finishes? <laughs> Who wants to kill me? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's what I can say about that. An artist's work is never finished. A mother's work is never finished, you know? So um, I'm glad that one of the uh, most important visitors to my, uh, to my both this uh, period is um, uh, Professor Bruce Nabrakwa. There is something um, about him, you understand? It's like, you know, I mean, governors expect visit, uh, presidents to visit them. We artists, we have our own presidents that we want to visit us. And again, not that anybody and everybody that has visited my, my, my installation is not important to me, but I want to say he's the most important person that visited my, my distance. I was, I was enamored by his presence in that place. Um, you know, that is the respect I want to consistently pay to those that came before me because they did a lot of work. We cannot say it enough. If not for the forest that they deforested, we will not be able to plant the cones that we are planting today. And we must always respect. We must always respect. So, um, to answer that question, he's still producing, and he turned ninety in um, in, in in he turned ninety in in this August, and he's having a solo exhibition in the uh, in US in the major museum and the museum I thank God they have also acquired my work so that I can have a conversation with when his exhibition opened you know so again I I you know I love the man you know so and I'm grateful for what they have done that whole period and the era absolutely why did the Europeans steal our art this is from a seven year old child so <laughs> all right this is how do you break down colonialism to a seven year old? <laughs> uh, because it was one of the most beautiful thing and the most amazing thing. And the, we were wonderful people and a very welcoming people. And those that have visited Lagos today, we know that um, Africans or Nigerians are very welcoming people, you know. So they're like, come into my house, you know, we have food, we have a bundle, amala, and everything. Then all of a sudden, you see the person just cutting away all your pulse and everything, tied somebody. No, let me not go there. But just, <laughs> you know, just say that your mom or your dad is no longer important in cooking the food that you used to eat and everything, that all the things, all the furnitures, all your toys um, have no meaning that they have to take them away, you know. So, I mean, that is the simplest way I can explain it to a seven year old that what was important to us were bullied out from us and they were replacing it with us. So if you have, um, I don't know, what is the most important toy to a seven year child and somebody that has more power and more gun, like really bully, come to your house and take that toy and possibly just put a plastic for you and say, you cannot play with this. Uh, that person, that bully has taken something very important for you from you, you know, so that is the best way I can explain it. I, I, hope, uh, I hope that was good enough, you know. So. Thank you. It's wonderful. Um, I think that I love that we got a question from a seven year old today. I think it's the first time I've gotten a question from someone that young. So thank you, whoever you are out there, because I think we also have a duty to our children to tell them stories in a way that is accessible to them. You know, we're both parents. Exactly. And I think um, institutions as well have that responsibility to engage them. And so I really hope that MOA and other forthcoming institutions will make efforts like ArtX has actually exactly. um, to bring children into the fold and into conversation with contemporary works of art and also our antiquities. Exactly. Do we have any other questions in the audience? Okay. Well, thank you very, very much. Victor. Thank you very much, Anita. I really appreciate it.